develop cultural programs and activities that foster an awareness of local, national, and global issues. And in recognition of Civil Rights Day, CCE wished to draw attention to the tragic events of May 31st, 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, referred to often as the Black Wall Street Massacre. This is the 100th anniversary year of those events. Sadly, the, these events are not as widely known as they should be. They've been both figuratively and literally buried. Assisting in our efforts to bring tonight's events to you several, are several co-sponsoring groups, and we're very thankful to them. They include Hofstra's Cultural Center, the Center for Race, Culture, and Social Justice, the Hofstra University Honors College, and Hofstra's Africana Studies Program. And tonight, it gives me tremendous honor to welcome our guest, John Whittington Franklin, an expert on the events in Tulsa in 1921. Mr. Franklin is the Senior Manager Emeritus for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and has specialized in the history and culture of Africa and its diaspora for the past 50 years. Mr. Franklin studied cultural anthropology at Stanford University. His career at the Smithsonian Institution began in Dakar, Senegal, while he was teaching English for the Senegalese Ministry of Higher Education. He served as the Africa-based researcher for the Smithsonian's 1976 Bicentennial Folklife Festival and presented the African and Caribbean delegations in Washington and across the United States. From 1987 to 1992, he organized seminars and symposia for the Smithsonian's Office of Interdisciplinary Studies. And from 1992 to 2005, he served as curator for the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritages Festivals in the Bahamas, Cape Verdean Culture, Washington, D.C., and Mali. In 2005, Franklin was among the first staff members of the Smithsonian's 19th Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened in 2016. As senior manager in the Office of External Affairs, he built partnerships for the museum with the universities and museums in the United States, Canada, Brazil, UK, France, West, East, and Southern Africa, and the Caribbean. For 10 years, Franklin served on the board of directors of the West Africa Research Center based in Docker. He served on and chaired the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, during which he was a member of the team which built the $3 million expansion of the Benneker Douglas Museum in Annapolis, Maryland, and the $30 million Reginald Lewis Maryland Museum of African American History and Culture in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland. Franklin also served on the Board of Governors of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, a think tank. He edited My Life and an Era, the autobiography of Buck Colbert Franklin with his father, John Hope Franklin. He's lectured for the US Department of State at the State Department to its visitors to the United States and at universities and museums in Brazil and France, as well as virtually around the world. Since his retirement from the Smithsonian in 2019, John Franklin established John Franklin Global uh, LLC to continue to lecture on cultural issues and consult with cultural and educational institutions. He currently serves on the French President's Commission for the Memory of Slavery and the Slave Trade. He works closely with UNESCO's Slave Route Project, developing conferences on the contemporary impact of slavery and for the past several years, he has focused on the legacy of slavery at American universities and is currently advising Davidson College's Race and Slavery at Davidson Commission. In 2021, he is, today, he is engaged in discussions in Tulsa, Oklahoma on facets of the commemoration of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, events his own grandfather survived. And now, before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone, if you have questions, please post them in the chat, or when Mr. Franklin is finished with his presentation, please raise your virtual hand, and we'll call on you, and, and you could ask your question. So, and with nothing more, I'd like to thank Mr. Franklin for being with us this evening, and um, please take it away. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Dalton, staff, students, dean, 
It's a pleasure to be with you. I had a wonderful uh, morning yesterday with one of your honors classes, and we were looking at the African diaspora. This evening, we're going to look at the events leading up to the Tulsa race massacre through the eyes of my grandfather, Buck Colbert Franklin, my father's father. And uh, a little bit later, I'll be reading some of his eyewitness accounts to that event. Let's see if I can do this share screen here. There you go. So uh, you're going to see much of my grandfather. He's the young man on the right. This picture is probably taken in 1898 or 99. I have one later that's 99 and you'll see he's a little bit older. Our family's history is unusual in that um, we were enslaved by American Indians. In 1830, the American Indian Removal Act was passed by freeing up 7 million acres of land for white farmers. The five so-called civilized tribes held African slaves, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole lived in the Southeast, in Georgia, in Mississippi, Alabama, the Carolinas, and Florida. So when the American Indian Removal Act was passed, they were forced to walk from their ancestral lands to the place we now call Oklahoma, which was then called Indian Territory. It was not viewed as valuable land. It's very dry in the summer, very cold, as you've been hearing about the weather in Texas and Oklahoma this week, um, far from the ocean, not rich land. Um, and so these African-Americans, and native people moved there in the 1830s. My great grandfather, David Burney, was born in Tennessee in 1820, a slave to the Chickasaw Burney family. He walked to Indian territory, became a farmer, rancher, black cowboy, freed himself and enlisted in the Union Army as David Franklin. He married Millie Franklin and they had 10 children. My grandfather in his autobiography, which my father and I edited called My Life and an Era, says in his first paragraph, I was born on the sixth day of May, 1879, near Homer, a small country village in what was then Pickens County, Chickasaw Nation, Indian Territory. I was the seventh of 10 children born to David and Millie Franklin. Dad was born in Tennessee, not far from Gallatin, and mother was born in Mississippi, not far from Biloxi. I was christened Buck in honor of my grandfather, Buck." End of quote. At the time of the Civil War, my grandfather's father ran away from his owner and joined the Union Army as David Franklin. Buck Colbert grew up on his family farm, learning to ride, rope, and sell cattle with his father in Texas, Kansas, the Oklahoma Panhandle, and Arkansas. In, 1980, in 1894, he goes to Berwyn to attend Dawes Academy and rides his horse home on weekends. In this photo here, we see him about 19 or 20 with his brother Matthew in the late 1890s. In 1896, he goes to Nashville to attend Roger Williams. A black, Roger Williams University, a black Baptist college where he meets Molly Lee Parker, his future wife. They study with their mentor, John Hope, for whom they will name their second son. When he leaves to teach at Atlanta Baptist, my grandfather follows him there in 1899. Here we see him photographed in the Carver Brothers studio in 1899 and 1901. While my grandparents are in college, petroleum and natural gas are discovered in Indian territory and Tulsa becomes the oil capital of the world. It attracts the Rockefellers and J. Paul Getty where they make fortunes before following petroleum to Texas, California, and Saudi Arabia. 
Much of the petroleum and natural gas is in the eastern part of the territory, belonging to Native Americans and African Americans. You may have heard of a recent court case settled by the Supreme Court involving that half of the state. My grandparents are married in 1903 and begin their lives as teachers and farmers in Springer and Ardmore. Fascinated by the law, Grandpa apprentices with black lawyers in Ardmore and takes correspondence courses in the law with the Sprague School of Law in Detroit from 1904 to 1907. He, go, he goes to Tennessee and studies by correspondence because he cannot go to the University of Oklahoma. He cannot go to the University of Oklahoma Law School. So black students in the 1870s, 80s, 90s have to go to historically black colleges. And um, even though his family pays taxes, he cannot go to the state university for either his undergraduate or graduate work. He takes the oral exam of the bar and scores the second highest and is admitted to the Oklahoma bar December 1907, one month after statehood. The first law passed by the state legislature is to assure that transportation is segregated, it's primarily on trains. Buses aren't really big yet at that time. Here, here is my grandfather with his uh, classmates in 1903 at uh, Atlanta Baptist. As I said, he follows John Hope uh, to Atlanta Baptist, but here he is on the second row, on the first row, second from the left with the book on his lap and wearing eyeglasses. So that's Grandpop in 1903. Here he is outside, he's on the right there, outside of his law offices in Ardmore in 1910. That's his handwriting. And at the bottom of the picture on the frame, he says, this is my horse and buggy of that time. And it's fascinating reading this picture because their law offices are inside this building, which has a German name. It says Great Western Cleaning and Pressing. I don't know what kind of dry cleaning you have in 1910. And then there's an ad behind the buggy saying Opera House Thursday, November. And I wanted to say November what? What is the date? But the photo hide, the buggy hides that date. Here he is inside that law office, seated on the left. He's 30 in this picture. And there's a photograph of President William Taft on the left. And you see two other lawyers and their secretary with a typewriter, a pile of newspapers, a lot of legal books. By 1915, Woodrow Wilson is president and imposes strict segregation on Washington, DC. The federal offices dismissing many black federal employees. President Wilson's classmate at Johns Hopkins, Thomas Dixon has written The Klansman which D.W. Griffiths films as birth of the nation, demonizing African-Americans, particularly during reconstruction and celebrating the Ku Klux Klan. With the end of World War I, black troops return from Europe where those with guns have fought under the French flag and won French medals, but Croix de Guerre. Those under the US flag loaded on unloaded ships, dug ditches and graves under Southern white officers. The return of these African-Americans is met with extreme hostility and many are lynched in their uniforms during the red summer of 1919 when three dozen American cities. Did any of you hear about commemorations of that in 2019? I only know of one commemoration, Baltimore. Representing a client in Shreveport, Louisiana, Grandpa is seated in the court with his client when a case is called. He stands with his client and the judge asks why he is standing in his courtroom. Grandpa replies that he's there to represent his client, whereupon the judge says, quote, no nigga is representing anyone in my courtroom. Sit down or get out, end of quote. In 1912, he moves to one of the all black towns, Rennesville, recruited by the city fathers. On the first Sunday, the city fathers come to my grandparents' home and said, we did not see you in church this morning to which my grandfather replied, 
that we attended the Methodist service. You're not a Baptist, but you went to Baptist institutions. We don't trust Methodists. So they refuse to give him business. Discouraged, he moves to Tulsa. A week from this, sad, uh, this Saturday, exactly 100 years ago, February 20th, 1921. So remember, Tulsa has become by this time the oil capital of the world, and this is what he sees. Leaving his wife and two youngest children, Anne Harriet and John Hope Six, Anne Harriet Seven and John Hope Six, he moved into I.W. Thompson's rooming house in Greenwood, the black section of town. The community was prosperous and bustling with the Dreamland Theater, Caver's Cleaners, the Girly Hotel, the Midway Hotel, the Stradford Hotel, Estate, Duck Eastman and Hughes Cafe, Carter's Barbershop, grocery stores, furniture and jewelry stores, real estate and oil leasing offices, restaurants, drug stores, professional offices of doctors, dentists, lawyers, at least 13 churches, including Mount Zion Baptist Church, Vernon AME, First Baptist Church North, and brick and frame homes. He met people like O.W. and Emma Gurley, J.B. Stradford, the renowned caterer, Kalira Butler, John and Lula Williams, the owners of the Dreamland Theater, J.D. Mann, and Tulsa star editor, A.J. Smitherman. He formed a law firm with attorneys I.H. Spears and O. Chappelle. Black Tulsans worked in Greenwood and for the many businesses as homes in white Tulsa. This was all to be destroyed May 31st to June 1st, 1921. As in many instances, riots begin with a black man accused of attacking a white woman. In this case, Dick Rowland, a shoeshine man, had to get to the colored restroom on the top floor of one of the downtown buildings. He touched or stepped on the foot of the white female operator who screamed. He was then arrested and taken to the city jail. The Tribune newspaper account suggested that a lynching was in order. All copies of that newspaper have disappeared from the newspaper archive. A white mob, soon to be deputized and armed, assembled outside of the courthouse and were confronted by armed black veterans. A shot rang out and all hell broke loose. Here's a part of my grandfather's eyewitness account of what he saw May 31st to June 1st, 1921. It was also the commencement season and the streets of the city are filled all day long with happy, innocent, carefree graduates, colored and white, walking proudly in their caps and gowns. The colored graduates are dreaming, building air castles and in their waking dreams, they see themselves rising and mounting higher and higher up the ladder of recognition and renown. But alas, their dreams are like Ponzi's financial bubble. The night grows a little older and a few shots are heard in the distance. At first one thinks it's fire signals. The night grows older and the shooting increases and becomes less intermittent. One becomes by the peculiar working of one's mind slightly disturbed and distressed. One's mind goes back to that news article about that purported assault and still further back about a month to the lynching of that white man in West Tulsa. This white man was taken from the Tulsa County Jail by a mob and hung. I believe to a telephone pole, my mind becomes thoroughly aroused. And he walks around the town. He tries to indeed convince other African-Americans not to go burn down the white section of town. And uh, he has difficulty talking with people. I was puzzled, he says. Of course, I knew that there was trouble, that a race riot or a race war as it afterward proved to be was in the making and that we would soon be in the midst of a great catastrophe if something was not done at once to avert it. It seemed difficult to me. You see, I had never been in a mob before. Up to then, I knew absolutely nothing about mob psychology. Since becoming a man, I have always been kept busy and never had an occasion to study the mob spirit. I had thought foolishly, I suppose, that a peaceable law-abiding citizen could go wherever he had business upon the streets. I was rudely disillusioned. About midnight, I arose and went to the north porch of the second floor of my hotel. And looking in the northwesterly direction, I saw the top of Standpipe Hill literally lighted up by the blazes that came from the throats of machine guns. I could hear buzzes, 
bullets whizzing and cutting the air. They were shooting now in every direction and the sounds that came from the thousands and thousands of guns were deafening. When the Eastern sky reddened, announcing the approach of day, I was still standing in that upper porch thinking, 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 and how different was the coming of this day from that of the day before. Grandpa goes on to say, I reached my office in safety, but I knew that safety would be short lived. I now knew the mob spirit. I knew too that government and law and order had broken down. I knew that mob law had been substituted in all its fiendishness and barbarity. I knew that the mobists cared nothing about the written law and the constitution. And I also now knew that he had neither the patience nor the intelligence to distinguish between the good and the bad, the law abiding and the lawless in my race. From my office window, I could see planes circling in midair. They grew in number and hummed, dipped and darted low. I could hear something like hail falling upon the top of my office building. Down East Archer, I saw the old Midway Hotel on fire burning from its top and then another and another building began to burn from the top. What, an attack from the air too, I asked myself. Lurid flames roared and belched and licked their forked tongues in the air. Smoke ascended the sky and thick black volumes emitted all the planes, now a dozen or more in umber, still hummed and darted here and there with the agility of natural birds of the air. Then a filling station further down East Archer caught on fire from the top. I feared now an explosion and decided to try to move to safer quarters. I came out of my office, locked the door and descended to the foot of the steps. The sidewalks were literally covered with burning turpentine balls. I knew all too well where they came from and I knew all too well why every building, burned, building first caught from the top. I paused and waited for an opportune time to escape. Where, oh, where is our splendid fire department with its half dozen stations, I asked myself. Is the city in conspiracy with the mob? I again asked myself. As I stood there in contemplation of these and other gruesome facts, I saw two sights that will live in my memory to my dying days. One was a woman on the opposite side of the street. She was traveling south, hair disentangled and disheveled in the very pass of whizzing bullets. She was calling wildly to a little tot that a few minutes before had dashed in panic before her and turned off Greenwood on Archer at the corner. I hollered to her, turn back woman, for God's sake, turn back. You will be mown down. Never turning her head, she answered as she hurried on, I must follow my child. And so she did follow her child and not a bullet touched her, although they literally rained down the street. This brave self-denying mother lives today here in Tulsa and with her that top, now a splendid young lady whom she risked her life to save. The other site was occasioned by the Piro building catching on fire from the top. This was a frame building then, meaning it's made out of wood. The fire dislodged those in the building, a woman, two children and three men. They emerged in wild confusion and came on in my direction. The little children, they were both girls, outran the others and passed the place where I was standing with the speed of the wind. The woman ran across the street and into the, and into the foot of the steps of my office building, right where I was standing and fell upon her knees and commenced to pray, totally oblivious of my presence. I don't think she ever saw me and such a prayer. She asked God to save her and her children from whom she'd just been separated. This prayer was uttered over and over. I am unable to say whether that prayer was answered or not, I have lived in Tulsa continuously ever since that memorable morning, but I have never seen that woman since. I know I would know her if I were to meet her again, even today. The three men, one of whom lugged a heavy trunk on his shoulder, were all killed as they were crossing the street, killed before my very eyes. Makes you feel like you were there. Well, my grandfather is rounded up as all the African-Americans are taken to different kinds of detention camps. He was taken to the convention hall, which is today the Brady Theater named after the Klansman who becomes mayor of Tulsa after that, Tate Brady. And uh, when he's released, um, the community is devastated. As you'll see, it looks like this, there's nothing left. 
there's one high school left, all the homes are gone, the businesses, 35 blocks are completely destroyed. And my grandfather sets up a law office in a Red Cross tent. That is my grandfather on the right, B.C. Franklin. His law partner on the left, I.H. Spears. You see that the tent has a brick floor. There are law books on the floor. And Miss Effie Thompson, who is African-American and was a classmate of my grandmother and grandfather at Roger D. Williams, asked to be their temporary secretary since the drugstore that she and her husband, Mr. Thompson, owned was destroyed in the massacre and fire. So you'll notice that she's at a typewriter. This is before computers, young people. And between I.H. Spears and Ms. Thompson's typewriter, that is a telephone. Next to the books, it looks like two tubes. One you hold in your ear, the other one you hold in your hand. So that's an old telephone from 1921. Imagine that a Red Cross tent in 1921 is outfitted with telephones so they could do business. Now the city has passed an ordinance in this state of confusion and emergency that you can only rebuild with non-flammable materials. And because people have lost everything, they don't have anything to build with other than the bricks from the homes that have been, businesses that have been destroyed and pieces of wood. So my grandfather says, go ahead, claim the land where your homes were, build whatever you can as a shack and we will fight this city ordinance. And he successfully fought it all the way to the state Supreme Court. But in this law clinic, he also took people's requests, people's claims for their insurance for their businesses and for their homes. This is when the fine print of the contract matters. And there are clauses that talk about acts of God, riot, et cetera. And so the insurance companies refuse to pay any of the claims of the businesses and homes that African-Americans had. It took four or five years to rebuild the community. As you see, it was scorched earth. No reparations were paid. And in 1924, my grandmother and her two youngest children are able to rejoin their father, my grandfather. And Tulsa is in the process of rebuilding. Uh, I just heard my father in a documentary that I hope airs in your area called Going Back to T-Town that was actually filmed in 1993. My grandfather, my father talks about coming to Tulsa as a 10 year old and the houses are in the process of being rebuilt. The churches have been able to rebuild to the basement level, uh, but it's still under construction. And in 1925, the city hosts the annual meeting of the National Negro Business League. You hear Tulsa referred to as Black Wall Street, Negro Wall Street. It's Booker T. Washington who visited Tulsa prior to the massacre that coined the term Negro Wall Street. Um, there are other Wall Streets, Negro Wall Streets. One is in Durham, North Carolina, for example, where uh, the Mechanic and Farmer Bank in North Carolina Mutual with businesses that were the center of uh, Black business uh, at a similar period, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So this whole story was suppressed following 1920. One. Uh, the days it occurred, it was in the national press, international press, I went to the BBC this year, and they said the BBC covered it in 1921. The New York Times covered it. Um, and I uh, got a very interesting correspondence from a rabbi in Chicago when he saw the 60 minute piece in June on Tulsa, which aired again this past Sunday. He went to the Yiddish press from 1921 and saw that the Yiddish press in the United States described what happened in Tulsa to the African-American community as a pogrom, describe it in exactly the same terms of, a, of the pogroms against Jews in Europe. And at the upcoming symposium, the John H. Franklin Reconciliation Symposium we're having May 26 to 28, we have invited the Yiddish journal, online journal in Geveb and the Yivo 
uh, Institute for Jewish Research in New York to put together a panel on the literature in Yiddish about the attacks on African-American communities. Um, so you never know what the sources of information are and in what languages you're gonna find the history of Tulsa. Uh, under the current mayor, G.T. Bynum, uh, there has been an investigation of the existing cemetery is looking for mass graves. It is said that 300 people were killed and there are people who said that they saw bodies float down the river, the Arkansas River and end up downstream. There are bodies that were seen on the sandbanks of the river. The city bought nine tons of ice that first week of June. No other time in history did they buy nine tons of ice. So uh, the last time I was there in December of 19, they had begun the investigations of the earth and they found a number of anomalies as the archeologists call them, that they think may be mass graves. Um, in a time of COVID, it's very difficult to assess how the commemoration will, will unfold in May of 2021. So we're having to make dual plans for it to be all a virtual commemoration. And then there may be the possibility of some small scale in-person gatherings. Uh, we have a very impressive lineup for our symposium. I'll send out to Professor Dalton to save the date so you can uh, consider registering for that symposium. Among our speakers, we have uh, Scott Ellsworth who's leading the team a forensic specialist looking at uh, possible grave sites. He also conducted much of the research for the National Park Service on this site. Um, when President Trump announced in June that he was going to Tulsa on Juneteenth, it drew attention to what had occurred in Tulsa 99 years ago. Uh, which was new to many people. Um, and it drew attention to the term Juneteenth, which really refers to June 19, 1865, when African-Americans in Texas learned that they were free, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation and almost three years after uh, Lincoln frees the slaves of Washington, D.C. in the Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862, Emancipation Proclamations, 1863. And uh, it, it reminds us that there's a range of dates when African-Americans are freed by their respective states, beginning with Vermont in 1777, many of the New England states in the 18, 1780s, some with what's called gradual emancipation. So that let's say, you're a five-year-old girl in Pennsylvania in 1780. Well, you won't be really free until you turn 18. And if you're a young man, you're not really free until you become 21. So there's extra years of work. Um, here are my grandparents reunited in 1924 in Tulsa uh, for the first time. There's grandpa, he's in his 40s now. And we have a number of images of him uh, in, this is in Saratoga. This is my favorite picture of him walking in Tulsa with uh, his tie flying and some papers in his hand. I assume some legal papers. Here he is on the front row with the hat as president of the North Tulsa Adventurers Club. And then he's honored as an attorney Toward the end of his life, he has a stroke. And he's honored in 1959, the year before he dies. But he has, that's a nice picture of him smiling there. But he has written My Life and an Era, the autobiography of Buck Colbert Franklin with using his left index finger since he lost use, lost use of his right hand to type two single space, 400 page drafts of this book. Then I edited this long after he passed away 
in uh, 1997 and published it by Louisiana State University. So um, that's one person's perspective of the Tulsa Race Massacre. There's lots of discussion now, there are books that have been written about it. There are many documentaries in the works. Um, and I think it'd be interesting for us all to see how it plays out during the rest of 2021. Um, we have to get, I have to get my second vaccination. It has to be safe to fly an airplane for me to even consider going to Tulsa uh, in May, but we'll see how things work out. If not, I'll be doing it just like this via Zoom <laughs> from my home here in Maryland. So uh, Professor Dalton, that's, I think we'll wrap it up here and welcome any questions or comments from the audience. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Franklin, for that. Uh, yes, if you have questions, I ask you to raise your virtual hand. We have one here. Um, Brittany Johnson, will you please unmute yourself? Hi, uh, Mr. Frank Franklin, thank you for talking. I mean, your story is very interesting and informative, and I'm really glad that you're here tonight. Um, one question I have is, do you know of any ways in which your grandfather was fundamentally changed following the massacre? Like any tendencies that he picked up that some might think are weird or symptoms of PTSD or anything like that? I don't know. You know, it'd be very interesting um, if they probably all needed counseling of some kind after the traumatic event. We do know that um, women had gave birth prematurely well, in that week or so they were in detention. My grandfather in his autobiography talks about hearing children being born while he's detained. Uh, many people leave Tulsa never to return. It's such a traumatic effect. Uh, the city is destroyed. And if you Google Tulsa race riot, you'll see a range of photographs of people fleeing the scene, uh, bodies being carted away on carts. Um, so you can just imagine how traumatic it must have been. Uh, I was in Bermuda at the Museum Association of the Caribbean a number of years ago, and we met a woman from Alberta, Canada, who said that she grew up with people who had left Tulsa after 21 and moved to Canada to be ranchers there. So just like when Hurricane Katrina happened and people dispersed from New Orleans to all parts of the country, the same thing happened in Tulsa uh, and people left. Some people were accused of fomenting the riot and were wanted and could not return African-Americans. Um, and so men, women, and children, when we reopen the museum, and I'm even going to suggest you go to the website for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we collected a number of oral histories for people who actually lived through the massacre. And one woman des describes how she's a little girl at the time, and uh, her mother calls her and tells her to come downstairs and get dressed. And as she comes down the stairs, she sees these white men who've knocked in their front door, carting away her mother's piano, her father's photographic equipment, and the children's piggy banks from the mantle of the house. So the homes, the black homes are looted by poor whites first, and then they set the curtains on fire to make sure that the houses burn. So you can imagine how traumatized children are, to say nothing of adults, seeing their homes destroyed, uh, seeing their entire community re reduced to rubble. So I don't know of any personal traits that he took on, but I think the entire community was traumatized. Meanwhile, White Tulsa goes on in the late 20s and 30s as though nothing happened. So we have some other questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Zevin. Can you unmute, your, unmute yourself, please? Yeah, so uh, I was just curious, like, why you think, you know, I, for me, I, I never heard about anything like this until, like, the George Floyd thing. It was never taught in high school, like, elementary school. 
And from just what I've gathered from talking to lots of other people, it sounds like that's pretty case, been the case pretty widespread. So I was just curious, like, why do you think it hasn't made it into, like, literature for high school, middle school students? Like, why hasn't it been a part of, like, the curriculum, you know, from, you know, I don't know, kindergarten, but, like, you know, you know, on the, like, in the school curriculum, like, as we're growing up, it just doesn't seem like it's been a part of, like, what we've been learning. And I'm, I'm curious how you think it got to be that way, if that makes sense. Yes, well... My father always referred to the preference in American history for what he called happy history. So you don't talk about the tragedies. You don't talk about the internment of Japanese Americans. You don't talk about the genocide of Native Americans. You don't talk about the oppression of women in history. Uh, when my father and two of his white historian colleagues tried to write the first inclusive history textbook in 1966, for adoption in the state of California, they got death threats. My father got his first death threats. So the people who are very uncomfortable with telling this kind of history. In Oklahoma, this was not discussed at all. Um, both black and white adults and black and white young people know that through their schooling, they did not learn about it in Oklahoma. And only recently has it become the focus of discussion in Tulsa. When US Senator Lankford came to see the exhibition that we did in the museum about this incident, the growth, destruction, and rebirth of uh, Greenwood, Black Tulsa, as a story of American resilience, Senator Lankford came with television and print reporters from Oklahoma City this is two years ago, who had never heard of this in Oklahoma City. So don't be surprised that you're in the Northeast and haven't heard about this. The people in Oklahoma haven't heard about this. So I said to Senator Langford at that time, and since then, that part of the responsibility of the centennial has to make sure that this is taught in the school system. It's supposed to be taught, but not everyone wants to teach it. And I talked to a, a, a black professor He's a PhD, but he was teaching in high school in Tulsa. He said the black parents didn't want to have it taught, the white parents didn't want to have it taught. So he had a hard time teaching it, even when it was sanctioned to be taught. Um, so it's a challenge. And I told Senator Langford not only do students need to learn it, but it's another process of making sure that adults who are outside of the education system learn about it as well. That's the challenge I gave to him. We'll see how successful they are this year. Thank you. Uh, we have you. another question from Ambrose. Would you uh, unmute? Thank you. Hello, Mr. Franklin. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I just, my, just, my one question is, um, what would have happened if um, the Tulsa riots uh, never happened in the first place? And follow-up question to that, would, would, Tulsa, would the, the Greenwood District still be considered the Black Wall Street of, uh, of the United States uh, to this day if uh, the riots never happened? Well, um, there would have been a prosperous business, black business district if the massacre had not occurred. Um, Tulsa went through a cycle of boom with the oil capital. And then as I mentioned, other places become um, more important as other petroleum and natural gas resources are found. And Tulsa goes into an oil decline it's still deeply involved in the processing, creating of the equipment, the pipes, the storage system. People make a gazillion dollars off of the technology around petroleum and natural gas. Um, but that business then goes on to Texas, which has you know, huge oil reserves as the oil reserves in Oklahoma diminish and people have to focus on other things. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then of course the petroleum is discovered in California. And then we start going to other places and you know the, the whole network of OPEC. And so Saudi Arabia, and then we continue to find petroleum in West Africa, um, in other parts of the Gulf states and the Emirates become powerful uh, from, from petroleum wealth. Now Oklahoma's next, Tulsa's next wealth comes with the advent of World War I and the building of the defense industry. 
And Tulsa becomes a place where airplanes are built and where the flight training and engineer, for all the people that fly airplanes, the engineers, the pilots, the co-pilots are trained in Tulsa. It becomes the headquarters for American Airlines. We build the airplanes for World War II in Tulsa. And the Royal Air Force of England, United Kingdom, comes and learns to fly planes in Tulsa. So Tulsa becomes an aviation uh, center, and it is to this day. Uh, and then other industries associated with banking and oil and petroleum and natural gas continue to be very significant. Um, I'm part of a project now to create a new research library at the University, the Oklahoma State University in Tulsa. And one of the things that we want to assure occurs with young people at that campus is that they interview African-Americans and Tulsans of all walks of life about what was life like earlier. Um, I met a man, for example, who became the highest man in the petroleum industry. And even though he is retired, no one has gone higher than him within that hierarchy. And these people need to be interviewed so that we can understand what their experience was like working in the aviation industry, working in the petroleum industry, working in natural gas. Uh, these are, these are um, Tulsa specific industries that you don't find in an Atlanta or a New York. No one's working in petroleum you know, fields in New York City, right? Uh, so there's a particular work that needs to be done in oral histories uh, in Oklahoma. And so I'm trying to encourage that process uh, with students, undergraduates and future students. Thank you. We have another question from Sarah. Sarah, if you've done. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, first off, I just want to thank you for um, speaking today. I'm a student at the Honors College as well. So I heard your talk yesterday morning, both were extremely informative and this one particularly powerful. Um, I wanted to ask uh, what the attitude was today in Tulsa with regard to this massacre and if there's been any consideration for reparations for the loss of property, businesses, homes. Um, the attitudes are varied. Uh, there are people who would like to forget this and not discuss it. The previous mayor was particularly concerned that the bombing by air not be discussed. It's bad for the city's reputation. Recalling the symposium in May, the future of Tulsa's past, because cities have to decide how they're going to portray their past uh, to future generations. Um, the second part of, hello what's the second part of your question again uh any consideration for reparations for the loss of homes and businesses yes yes the survivors and descendants um gathered with legal counsel in the 90s and early 2000s and pressed for reparations and um very prominent lawyers were leading this effort and the judges felt that the statute of limitations had been passed and therefore reparations were no longer under consideration. Uh, this was a great disappointment to the few survivors that we had. And uh, we're down to, I think, the last survivor, one person who was uh, my father's age and went and got to get her PhD as well, uh, Dr. Hooker to pass last year. And then another lady surfaced who was 106. Um, so, you know, it's very hard to have people in 2021 who survived something that occurred 100 years ago. Uh, these are all, they're centenarians and we're losing them. But uh, a woman named Eddie Faye Gates took it upon herself to interview as many of these people as possible. So we actually have excellent oral testimony from the people who survived. Uh, what's missing, there are white people who survived this and the people discuss only black survivors. Now, there were many more white people in Tulsa than black people at all times. And I'm wondering if white people have amnesia 
if no one recorded what their perspectives were in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s before they died uh, of what their perspectives were. So there's a some sense for me, part of the city is in Holocaust denial and part of the city is not. Uh, it's a great embarrassment to the city, but you have to, you have to deal with your past um, in an honest manner. So this is still contentious in Tulsa today, 100 years later. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Brittany. Hi. Um, I did, oh, I was just reading. I was just going to let somebody in the chat talk if, if they didn't, because I already spoke, but I don't think there are any questions in the chat, so I'll just go ahead. I'm just wondering, Mr. Franklin, how the massacre um, impacted your family long term in the sense of building familial wealth. I mean, how long did it take your family to even get back to where they were when your grandfather first moved to Tulsa back in February of 1921? Right. Well, he was living in a rooming house. He'd saved money to be able to get a place for my grandmother and my father and his youngest sister to live in. They were supposed to move to Tulsa. My grandmother was a teacher. So she was teaching in Rennesville, this Black village. And she'd given notice to the school authorities that she would be leaving Rennesville at the end of June. Well, by the end of June, there was no Tulsa for her to move to. And so she and my father and his youngest sister had to stay behind in Rennesville. Those city fathers weren't very nice to my grandmother. They had denied her maternity leave when my father was born. And after she, tendered her resignation. They said, but we don't need to hire you again. So she worked in even a smaller village where she had to ride horseback every day and leave the children, leave her children behind. And they were scared to death. You know, they burned the house down because they had the, this before electricity in this village. So they had to light the, the lamps with the oil lamps as it got dark and they were terrified that they'd burn the house down. Um, so they're able to move to Tulsa in 24. And as my father mentioned in this documentary, Black Tulsa was still in the process of rebuilding. It eventually rebuilt, but my grandfather <laughs> um, never made much money in the law. I don't know if you know about this, but sometimes people paid doctors and <laughs> attorneys with a chicken or a meal because <laughs> they didn't have any money. So when my father goes away to college, he goes to Fisk where he meets my mother. It's interesting, my grandparents meet in Nashville and my parents meet in Nashville at completely different schools, different time period. His dream is to become a lawyer and a successful one and go back and help his father out of poverty. But unfortunately, dad runs into Professor Theodore S. Courier, a historian, and my father falls in love with history and then goes on to become a historian, never to teach law <laughs> until he retired from the University of Chicago and retired from Duke's history department and then is asked to teach constitutional history at Duke Law School, which he does for seven years. So he ends up teaching his constitutional law but not in Oklahoma and long, long, long after his father has passed. So uh, he's shaped by the law. His mother opens the first daycare in Tulsa, which is for which she is recognized now. Um, and then so Tulsa rebuilt and the black business is rebuilt until the interstate system comes in in the 50s. And if you look at every black business section in Richmond, Durham, Nashville, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Richmond, all of the black business districts are destroyed when the interstate systems come in. Blacks don't yet have the vote. It's before Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing, and they don't have the economic clout that wealthy white neighbors have to go to Congress and say, you will not build a highway through my neighborhood. So the black businesses districts across the United States are destroyed 
and Tulsa's Black business district is destroyed by the interstate coming through it. Well, Mr. Franklin, I, I want to thank you very much uh, for sharing the story of your grandfather with us. Uh, I feel honored to, to have played a role in bringing you to uh, the university, albeit virtually. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, normally, you know, these kinds of events can seem dated and distanced, but to see them at least sort of through the, the lens of your father makes or grandfather makes them a lot more immediate. And uh, I was thinking as I was listening to the experiences he, he recollected of those riots that, you know, that they're not parts uh, buried in history, but we're seeing what we're capable of now in light of the events of January 6th. And that we're still capable of, of acting this way. Uh, and so anyway, it, it's valuable to see um, this through uh, through through his experiences, um, your grandfather's story tells us that to to fight racism, uh, we have to remain vigilant, uh, and that we're still capable of the very worst. We want to thank you very much for being with us uh, as we recognize uh, civil rights here at Hofstra University and during Black History Month. Thanks so much. And uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. For this opportunity. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for the questions. They were great. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Have a nice Thank day. You. And have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.